Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody here this morning. Really appreciate your presence. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, specifically looking at uh, Matthew chapter 6. And we were looking at verses 25 through 34 when we left off last Sunday morning. Before we get started this morning, if you will, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We praise you and thank you for another glorious day to come out and worship you and study your word, Father. We ask that you would lead and guide us in this study, Father. Teach us what you want us to know, Father. Help us to pay close attention to what the Lord is teaching us, to take these things to heart and put them into use in our lives, Father. We, we thank you for your Son who came and gave himself, Father, that we could have this relationship with you as your children. And we just, we need your help and your guidance in this life, Father, and that's what we're asking you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, our, well, let me switch over to the right uh, thing here, if I can find it. I may have lost it. Nope, there we go. So we got our little birdie here. We're not supposed to be worrying. Do not worry is the theme of these verses. So... And I want us to see something from the Old Testament, which I think goes along with this idea that Jesus is teaching. This is kind of a very brief summing up. And that is Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And that's talking about us if we will trust the Lord, if we will trust in God. So if we look at verse 25 of our scriptures, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Notice that Jesus starts this verse with therefore, meaning because what I just said previous to this, right? So how do we sum up what he had just told us like in the verses before this? You want to know what he was talking about, the life being the land of the body and uh, about the... Well, I was looking like more immediate. If you, if you, if you look immediately before, he was talking about the lamp of the body and serving two masters. He was telling us basically to focus on godly things, not earthly things and lay up treasure in heaven because where your treasure is that's where your heart will be right so that's what he's saying therefore because I just said those things therefore don't worry about your life here this earthly life and these earthly things we should be focusing on the godly heavenly things and not worrying about the day-to-day -day mundane things that are just not that important and then he brings up the reference here in verse 26 about the birds. He says, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So, what's the, what would you say the idea of this verse is? In verse 26, where he's telling us about the birds. Yes, Pat? Right, he's following along that same idea, right? Don't be concerned about these daily things. He's saying, look, God takes care of the birds. Are you not more important than the birds? The birds are not his children, right? The birds are part of his creation. They're wonderful things. We all appreciate them. But as his children, we're more important, right? So he's, he's just saying, and, and you notice, he says they, they neither reap nor sow, or gather into barns. However, we know that birds birds actually work pretty hard to get their food. They're always Not busy doing birds. stuff. Huh? Not my birds. Not your birds? Well, does that mean you're feeding your birds too much? <laughs> yeah, that happens. But generally, birds, they kind of work and, you know, they're, they're working. They're busy getting their food. So, you know, it's not saying that we should be lazy. But on the other hand, we don't have to worry. God will take care of us. He will supply what we need. You know, it kind of goes back to praying for our daily bread and, you know, praying for what we need each day and knowing that God will supply that. 
And uh, and then also, you know, he's talking about how we are of more value, we're precious to God, and there are other places in the Bible where it says we are precious to God, right? So if we look at verse 27, he says, Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, this can also be translated as which of you, by worrying, can add one hour to his life. For some reason, those Greek words can have both of those meanings. So that may seem a little odd to us, but that's, that's not our language. So, But it could be either way. It makes more sense to me if he's saying um, how you know that worrying cannot add an hour to your life that makes a little more sense to me but it's okay either way worry is not going to do either one for you so um, the word for worry here that he's using means to be overly anxious it's not just you're concerned about something I think we talked a little bit about being concerned for things that's one thing that's okay but this word means to be overly anxious, like in a disturbing, distracted way. And so it's pre preventing us from normal, good activity and, and thought. So we know that a lot of anxiety can actually be you know, destructive and bad for our mental and physical health. So if we look at uh, verse 28 through 30, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now, there is two different ways to think about this in my mind. One is the natural need, of course, for, for clothing, for warmth and that type of thing, right? But also, there's also the vanity side of that. Are we a little too worried about having the, the fancy clothes, the designer clothes, the dressy clothes? Are we, you know, putting too much emphasis on our appearance over our substance, that type of thing? So it's... I look at that two different ways. Part of the need for clothes and then part of that vanity thing. Are we, are we too concerned with that? So uh, what are the ideas that Jesus is repeating in, the, in these verses here? Depend on him for some of this stuff. That's right. Where it comes he's right. encouraging us at the end of the day, right? He's encouraging us to trust in God, right? So he's encouraging us to trust in God. He's telling us that God loves us and will provide for us. That's what he's stressing to us, right? So why is Jesus repeating this like this in, a, in different ways? Because we're worriers and we take everything upon us and think we have to do it ourselves. Yeah, because we're worriers and he doesn't want us to worry. And we do try to do everything ourselves. And we have to accept that there are things in life that we can't control anyway, right? So we, we do want to be cautious of that and not try to do everything um, ourselves. See, yes? Uh, with verse 27, the idea is that there's really no benefit in getting all worried and anxious because it's not going to change anything. There, you, you can, you're powerless, really. Uh, the only power we have is through Him. To have faith and reliance on Him, we're able to accomplish things. <laughs> Right. A waste of our time. Right. In verse 27, that worrying, that anxiety, that's not a good positive thing. It's really useless when you get off into that type of worry and anxiety. It's just detrimental. It's just all negative at that point. There's nothing good about that. So that is in 20 in verse 27, he really is expressing that uh, that worrying is useless to that degree. And and I'm going to call it anxiety because it really means more of that kind of anxiousness about something you can't change, not really talking about being concerned about something that you might be able to do something about or can help with or something like that. So, because there, there is that difference. Does anybody have anything else on that? 
All right, so verses 31 and 32, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all... Oh, yeah, that you need all these things. For a minute I thought I was adding, sorry. So, um, so what's this reference to where he says here again, he says, Therefore... Right, the, just the things he had said before. Again, he's he's just saying, you know, because I just told you not to worry about these things, you know, so don't don't worry about them. He's he's repeating again, right? He's just repeating these ideas because God will provide. He's really trying to assure us that we don't need to be stressed and anxious and worried about these things, right? Yes. First Peter five seven. Yes. It says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Right. So first Peter five seven, we're told to cast all our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. Again, another assurance in the same same idea, right? You know, we always hear the saying, how many times does he have to say it? Well, that's... And, and yet he has to repeat so many things over, over again for us to get the idea. Right. God cares. Right. A lot of times we do have to have the same idea repeated for us to understand that. Yeah. Especially when it comes to God. and Because the world will tell you so many times that God doesn't care about you if he even exists. You know. But, you know, for us to realize and, and understand that he really does care about us, that he's extending his grace to us all the time. That's, that's important for us to understand, and that's why it gets repeated so much. So, let's see. I'm trying to think if my question makes sense now. I had a question here, but I'm reading it now, and I'm kind of wondering. Um, so, in verse 32 here, he says, For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, right? Does that, does that remind you of anything he said previously, before? Because he said something very similar to that back when he was talking about uh, the Lord. In the Lord's Prayer, you know how the, God knows our needs and we just need to pray and ask anyway. Um, because that is right and proper, but we should trust God for those things. So again, he's kind of repeating that same idea again. Yes? Yeah, uh, verse 8, I think, right? Chapter 6, verse 8. Uh, yeah. Therefore do not be like them for your body before you ask. Right. So, <coughs> chapter 6, verse 8, before you ask. That's right. Yes, uh, Pat? In Philippians 4, and verse 6, it talks about 72. Yes, it does. And we're going to, I do want us to look at that when we... Uh, because in Philippians verse 4, let me get there. In verse 6, uh, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, let your requests be made known to God. And the idea there is not to worry about these things. Pray to God with thanksgiving, understanding that you know, he's going to supply our need. And he answers our prayer, just not always the way we want it answered or the way we think it should be answered. But that's, that's because he knows what's best, and that's what he does. He does what's best for us. Um, let's see. So if we look at verse 33, did anybody have anything else? I'm sorry. Yes. It is similar to that, right? He knows what we need, kind of like you know what your child needs. Now, you may not be as omniscient as God, but in general, you do know what your child needs, what they're going to need going, you know, going forward in life as they're growing. So, yeah. Grateful, thankful God that we have 
Right. We should be thankful for all those things that God provides for us. And she mentioned the uh, Proverbs 31 where we are looking at the, the worthy woman who's, you know, she's busy taking care of and doing those things, you know, because God has provided the food to be able to feed people and all of that and the things that make the clothing for her family and all those things. So it's very similar to that. She's looking for the needs of her family. She's trying to take care of her family. Um, if we look at verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So what are these things? The things that we need, the things that we need right? Just the mundane things that we need every day, yes. It's kind of pointing back to verse 20 where he says, store up treasures in heaven. And right. Instead of all, you know, we get all worked up and wrapped up in the things that we see and touch and do every day. Whereas things that are up in heaven, the spiritual things, we're not touching those and we're not seeing those yet. So I think the things on earth get us distracted. Right, we do get distracted with the things of this life and that, right? So, so you're saying not to worry. Again, still on that subject of like not being anxious, not worrying about the earthly things. Now he's like, so what should your priority be, right? Yes, ma'am? The immediate context talked about eating and drinking and clothing. And don't worry about those things, but you know, right. put God first. Right, don't worry about all those things, but put God first. So, so our priority then is to seek the kingdom, right? That's our priority, to seek the kingdom. And it says his righteousness. So uh, if we take this in steps, the first thing we're seeking is the kingdom. Now, what does it mean to seek the kingdom if you're seeking a kingdom? Maybe you think of it as you're seeking a city or something. Yes? Well, if we think about the earthly kingdom, you know, we would be faithful and allegiant to the king like in, a, in an army. You know, we're, we're putting the priorities of the kingdom first and not our own things. Win the battle and that sort of thing. We're going to put effort towards that kingdom. Right. If you're putting putting effort to uh, you're putting the kingdom first, what's best for the kingdom? You're following the ruler. Your allegiance is to the king, and those things. Right. And I was thinking of it at a, in a weird. I guess maybe I'm a little odd, but I was thinking of it in a different way. If you're seeking a kingdom, if you're seeking a place, you're trying to get to it. Right. You're trying to enter it. Right? That was, I took it at its most basic level, okay? So you're seeking to be a citizen of that kingdom, right? We're seeking to be a part of that kingdom. We want to be a citizen under the Lord. That's the idea. So we're seeking to be that. And then we talk about how do we enter the kingdom? Well, how do we enter the Lord's kingdom? By obeying the gospel. By obeying the gospel, by. Repenting, being baptized, right? That's how we are added to the, the Lord's uh, church. That's how we become a citizen of his kingdom, right? So just, and then it talks about also seeking his righteousness. So how do we obtain his righteousness? By knowing what his righteousness is. And one of the ways to know it is God's word. Well, by knowing his, what his righteousness is, and like you said, one of the ways to know that is by his word, but also there's the idea that we attain the Lord's righteousness again through baptism and repentance, because it's not our righteousness. My righteousness is not worth anything. That's not going to get me into heaven, not in any way. But the Lord's righteousness, when we're, when we're saved in salvation following the Lord, and trying to live that faithful life, his righteousness is what's going to get us in heaven, right? That's what's going to keep us a citizen of the kingdom. So that was just how I was thinking of it, very simple, very basic, I know. But that's what he's encouraging these people to do back then, and it applies to us still today. So once we do that, what is the promise then of verse 33? Well, I guess we talked about that, didn't we? All those earthly things will be added to us, right? Because God will guide us to the good things in this life. He will guide us to all those things we need. So if we look, does anybody have anything else on that? Yes. I think you were thinking of the verse in Romans 5. The first few verses in Romans 5 about um, he makes us righteous. 
Romans 5. In Romans 5, I know he talks about baptism and how we, we, you know, we die, we die to our life and we're rose, we raise, we're, okay, we are raised again in Christ, right, to live a new life. So it's his righteousness and, and that life we're living for, for Jesus, yes. And I forget which, exactly which verses that is. I've, I've done that before. If we look at Romans, I'm going to go there. We'll just, I have it right here. If we look at Romans 5, and I think it's around the first six or seven verses, um, I'm going to kind of, well, maybe not. Hold on a second. Yeah, if you start in 1, it says, Therefore, we've, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I see. But that's not really what I was thinking of because I was thinking he's talking about, yeah, we get down a little further. Here we go. Death in Adam, life in Christ. We go down around uh, verse 12 and such. Uh, he talks about Jesus bringing that. Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong verse. That may be what I'm thinking of too. I just thought about that. It's I think I'm thinking of Romans chapter six, and you're thinking of chapter five, which is good. There's a lot of good there too. Yeah, I'm thinking of the first few verses of chapter six. Sorry. So he says, "Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead." By the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if, we're, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And he, <clears throat> excuse me, then he talks about the old man and all of that. So, anyway, um, let's see, we were looking at, so, so verse 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, if you were going to say that today, and there's even a song that kind of says this type of thing, how, how might you rephrase that? Don't worry about tomorrow because you have enough problems for today. Right, don't worry about tomorrow because, you yeah, that's right. And I was thinking of, you remember, one day at a time, right? Oh. We're just... You know, just one day at a time. Sweet Jesus, ain't that right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I thought maybe you were going to allude to the Don't Worry, Be Happy song. <laughs> oh, that's true. That was popular a while back, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And that, that has its own benefit, I guess, if you think about it that way. And this just made me think of living life one day at a time, right? Trusting God. Yes, Ben. Oh, okay. I'm not as familiar with that song, but that's good. Okay. So, does anybody have anything else on that? Because that's what we're looking at is just trying to live one day at a time, right? It doesn't mean you can't have a savings plan or that you can't prepare, you know, for tomorrow in a reasonable way, but just not to be overly anxious about that, you know? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Remember, our... The Lord is our shepherd, the good shepherd. He will lead us to the good pasture. Um, and if we look at these verses, he's really stressing what's important to us here, um, what we should be following and chasing after in this life. And just know that, you know, peace, peace of mind in this life comes from understanding God's promises to us. That's, that's where I find the most contentment in my life. Yes. Oh, the prepping thing. I've heard about that too. And, and there are people who've always done that for, for a long time. Some people really prepare for the apocalypse, right? They have the bunker, they have the food storage and all this stuff. I, if, if that, I can't promote that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, I guess you could do something like that in a reasonable way because even the government says, you know, if you should have enough stuff on hand to last you like a few days or a few weeks in case of an emergency of some weird kind, 
Not necessarily an apocalypse, right? But I think yes. you have to be prepared to a certain extent. Up where I live, a lot, most of you don't know, I live up on a mountain. Mm -hmm. that, it's rather scary to come down sometimes. So I keep extra food, extra supplies for the winter months. And I know <coughs> there could be a deep snow, and I'm going to be snowed in for a few days. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But no. I go overboard and make 10 years worth of stuff just right. in case. Now that's going overboard. Right. Having some stuff stocked up for those tough times, like you're talking about maybe, maybe you live somewhere where you get snowed in for a while. You know, in the old days, the old uh, hunters and trappers and stuff, when they lived out in the wild, they had to stock up for like the whole, like six, eight months, because they were only going to come to town maybe for a whole year, because they, sometimes they only came to town once a year to grab whatever they could get. And then they're back off in the wild. That wasn't un, unreasonable on their part. They knew with the weather they weren't going to be able to get back in. You're talking about a similar thing. You might get snowed in for a few days or a week. So you just need to be stocked up on some stuff. That's that's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that type of stuff. Right. You know, whenever you do, and you can go overboard with that. I can see me having 30 or 40 uh, cans of Spam sitting in my room. Yes. That would be going a little bit overboard. Right. If you're stocking up for 10 years or the apocalypse, that's a bit much, right? Right. Okay. So, but the main thing here is, you know, to understand that having that peace of God here, Jesus is encouraging us to trust, to trust in God. Um, and Paul stated something very similar. If we look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, which we've alluded to a couple of times, um, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So I think it's very important, that last verse, that we meditate on the good things and don't get anxious and concerned and worried about these things, especially things if you have no control over it. Worrying about it is not going to do any good. Being, and I'm talking about that anxiety again, that being overly anxious. Now you might say I started too soon in verse 4 that they don't really count, but I've always found that rejoicing and singing praises does count, and that helps a lot. So it's hard to be worried and anxious when you're praising the Lord and thanking Him for everything He's doing for you. Plus, if you remember that the Lord is right there, the Lord is at hand. He's always with us. And just being grateful for those things. So what's the most important thing we should meditate on? The Lord, the Bible, right? Right. So we should be meditating and studying God's Word. Does anybody have anything else on this? Yes. Prayer is another thing. Yes, and we should be praying, right? We should be praying and we should be thanking God instead of saying, give me, give me, give me. Right, we should be praying and thanking Him for our blessings. If we if we acknowledge all our blessings, that always helps us. That always calms us and helps us to have better faith and think on those things. Yes? A lot of times we, I'm looking for a we'll hear something that is upsetting. Maybe it's something on the news, something that we, we end up, it keeps coming back to mind, even though we don't want to think about it, but we're like, that, that's concerning. What is that? Right. There's a lot of fear mongering in the media and different things. It's it's good to be informed, but sometimes they really want. I, I'll say it sounds like they really want you to be afraid a lot of times and be a fearful of everything. And uh, 
we don't need to worry about those things in that way. We don't, you know, we see a problem, we see an issue, maybe, maybe there are banking problems or something, but we don't need to be anxious about those things or worried about those things in, in that way. It should not distract us from, you know, living our life for the Lord. So, does anybody else have anything on chapter six? All right. So, if we look at Matthew chapter seven, if we look at Matthew chapter seven, it starts off here in verses one through six. We'll look at those first, but uh, to look at our workbook. Um, just in general, well, just in general, Jesus is, in this chapter, Jesus is kind of closing the Sermon on the Mount. He's stressing some final points to his audience, thus us, also. And um, the workbook authors points here of this, uh, points to ponder the nature of judging condemned by Jesus. And we'll talk about that, how Jesus' uh, golden rule differs from that found in other religions, and the importance of doing the Father's will to being saved. So if we look at the first question for this chapter he has, what are the main points of the chapter? Uh, righteousness with respect to man's relation to man in uh, verses 1 through 12, and exhortations to enter the kingdom in verses 15 through 29. So if we look, I want to start with the first five verses, actually. Verse six is kind of its own animal. It goes with these, but it's kind of its own thing. So Matthew chapter seven, verses one through five. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not consider the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So if we look at question two in the workbook, what sort of judgment is Jesus warning against? Yes, ma'am. Self-righteous hypocritical judgment over the right. <laughs> right, kind of a self-righteous hypocritical judgment, also condemnation, right? Where the person is condemning someone, right? So if we look at, I'm going to have to uh, I apologize. I don't think I thought uh, all of this through exactly. Let me go here. I'm going to bring something up. I broke these out in different. Uh, I broke these out in different slideshows to make it easier. Each chapter gets bigger and bigger as I go, so I don't have just one Matthew file. It's too big. So, if we look at how the world looks at judgment, this is what the world would say, right? They look at it this way: Don't judge my actions. Don't judge my lifestyle. Don't judge me at all, right? And that's how they take this, this first verse, if we look at the first verse. But what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that idea? Yes, ma'am? Well, it's not taking the broader context. It's not even taking the full verse. I mean, like, uh, <laughs> in, in John seven twenty four, Jesus says something similar. He says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So he's explicitly telling us to judge. And I think in this context, he is similarly, you know, Get your own house in order before you, you're condemning others. Right. There is a verse, and, and Matt, Matt mentioned this, and this is what I had on my thing too. It misses the point that he's really making because even in John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So what we really have to do is, in verse 1, look at the word for judge. And it means it actually means to pass judgment on or to condemn. It's not really like you're deciding between two flavors or two colors. That's a certain kind of judging. But this is like more of a condemnation, right? That you're, sin you're passing that, uh, 
that judgment or condemnation on someone. So he literally means do not condemn others so you are not condemned. That's the idea. Now, that may sound like it goes with this, but, but hold on, that's not exactly right. Okay, The word for judgment in verse 2 is different and it refers more to sentencing and punishment, right? So he says, notice that the, uh, so look back to verse 2 real fast. For what, basically you could say, uh, whatever sentence you give to someone else, you will also receive the same sentence, right? The same punishment for that same thing. So, because that's more of, again, it's more of a sentence of punishment, not really judging and judgment in the way we think of it. So, so in these two verses, like Matt was saying, this is talking about kind of a hypocritical, harsh, unloving condemnation. Yes, Pat, did you have something? Right. Well, if you're judging a length, you have to go to like a ruler, right, or a measuring thing. So the same thing goes if, well, I think the scripture says this, but no, I think it says that. What do we do? We go to the scriptures and actually find out. Right. Our measuring stick or tape is the scripture, right? So we have to go to the Bible to see what it actually says, right? That's how we measure those things out in that in the sense that you're referring to. So, let's see. Yes, I'm sorry. There was a good uh, point that Jesus makes when they brought the woman who was called in adultery. Mm -hmm. And he says, you would, without sin, cast the first stone. In other words, you're judging her. How about your sins? Right. And that is, that's a good example of them. When, the, when those people brought the woman that was caught in adultery before Jesus... And he said, let those without sin, you know, cast the first stone. He's getting them to look at themselves. Are we really any better than that person we're looking at? And that's part of what Jesus is going to be getting at here in the Sermon on the Mount, too. But uh, our time is up for this morning. So I really appreciate your attention and your participation. Thank you very much.